how are the birth of punk rock, Major League Baseball, and a robber baron from the 1800s connected? We're about to piece it all together. It's a wild story that begins with one of the juiciest scandals of the 1870s. That's delightful. And ends with the birth of an equally wild cultural movement a century later. Where's this club, CBGB's? But first, what if I told you that one of the most notorious punk venues in New York City during the 1970s very nearly never came to be? After all, before CBGB's was CBGB's, it was CBGB and Omfug, which stood for country, bluegrass, blues, and other music for uplifting gormandizers. Yes, really. It was a venue for that, whatever that was. This is the story of how a tragic accident transformed CBGB and Umfug into the cultural phenomenon that we, as fans of punk, rock, and alt-rock, know, love, and appreciate. I'm Andy Fenstermaker, and this is another episode of Poetic Wax, where I dig deep into the record collection that I've been piecing together for well over 25 years, and pull out albums to share the history of a band, an album, a song, or in this case, a scene. Today I'm pulling out my 1977 copy of Marquee Moon by Television. I'm pulling out my copies of The Ramones, The Modern Lovers, all to dig deep into the venue that helped truly launch the New York punk rock scene in the 1970s. That's where the Ramones and Blondie got their start. The Broadway Central Hotel. Before punk was a thing, there was really no true focal point for what was going on in the underground music scene. Sure, there were venues, but they weren't truly centralized. The closest thing to it, though, was the Mercer Art Center in the Greenwich Village neighborhood. This spot was about as central as you could get to the underground musical and cultural scene in New York City between about 1971 and 1973. Located at 240 Mercer Street, it was part of the Broadway Central Hotel, originally titled the Grand Central Hotel. The Grand Central Hotel had opened a century earlier, in 1870, with a lot of fanfare and grandeur. In the late 1800s, it was a hub for the famous and wealthy. Boasting eight stories and 630 rooms, at the time of its opening, it was the largest hotel in the United States. Within a decade, it would become famous for two additional events. First, it was the scene of a murder. According to an article on villagepreservation.org, the hotel was, quote, the site of one of the juiciest scandals of the era. It was all sex, scandal, brutal crime, sports, uh, children with incurable diseases, and lost puppies. Well, that's only partially right. In 1872, robber baron Jim Fisk was shot and killed by former partner Edward Stokes in a quarrel over the affections of actress Josie Mansfield. Fisk was no stranger to scandal when alive, either. Before Black Friday was a shopping holiday, one now completely intertwined with the second record store day, it had more sinister undertones. Everybody's doing it, from Jay Gould and Jim Fisk right on up to President U.S. Grant himself. Befriending President Ulysses S. Grant, Fisk and his partner Jay Gould attempted to use the president's good name in a scheme to corner the gold market in New York City in 1869. This triggered a gold panic and financial crisis. Three years later, a different partner would shoot him dead. The second notable event took place on February 2nd, 1876, when eight baseball teams met at the hotel and formed what became the National League in Major League Baseball. The league would celebrate both its 50th and 75th anniversary at the hotel, but they wouldn't get a chance to celebrate their centennial. Not that they'd want to, which you'll see why. The collapse of the Mercer Arts Center. 
A century after its opening, the hotel had fallen on hard times. As the New York Times put it, it had become, quote, a cesspool of squalor and crime. No longer the glorious locale it once was, by 1969 it had become a welfare hotel for 300 residents, dubbed the University for its proximity to NYU. In 1971, Art Lagoff opened the Mercer Art Center on two of the hotel's floors. The Mercer Art Center was housed in the former ballroom and catering area with six different theater spaces. Some notable names frequented the space, including actor Rip Torn, who was in successful productions of Macbeth and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. If you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. What? It was also frequented by actor and theater director Gene Frankel and early pioneers of video art Woody and Steina Veluska. Though successful, those productions came at a cost, and to help pay for them, as well as pay for much-needed renovations, the Mercer Arts Center opened its unused spaces to the fringe rock bands of the day. Perhaps most notably, the New York Dolls played some of their first gigs there, becoming regulars at the space. The Ramones, Suicide, the Modern Lovers, they all used and regularly performed at the center as well. However, it all lasted just two years. In the first half of 1973, some work was done on the basement, and following that construction, the building began showing accelerated levels of fatigue, with cracks and bulges appearing in the walls. Then came Friday, August 3rd. It began making all sorts of strange noises, creaks, groans, stuff like that. People were aware of it. I mean, with audible noise... How couldn't you be? But before anything could be done, well, here's a quote from writer and actor Trav S. D., who penned an article on the 50th anniversary of the event. Shortly after 5 p.m., pieces started to tumble off the building, and then the whole thing gave way. If it had happened just a couple hours later, the theaters might have been full of audiences for that evening's performances. As it happens, four of the hotel residents were killed, and several others were injured. Among the dead were residents Herbert Whitehead, Kay Parker, and Arthur and Peggy Sherwin. Nineteen others were injured in the collapse. It was Panicsville there, said then Mercer owner Seymour Cabock. By 3.35 p.m., Cabock had called hotel manager Joseph Cooper about the problem. Cooper tried and failed to reach an engineer to assess the situation. At around 5, shortly before performances were set to begin, bricks began falling from the Mercer Arts walls. The hotel started to crumble at 5.10 p.m., taking parts of some theater space with it. Soon, the building collapsed onto Broadway, spilling tons of debris on the street. Following the collapse, what remained of the hotel would ultimately be demolished. Today, a 22-story dormitory for the New York University sits where Mercer Art Center and the Broadway Hotel once was. But where does CBGB's come in? Here's another quote. The four plays taking place at the time, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, El Grande de Coca-Cola, The Proposition, and Tub Strip, as well as the bands, found new homes throughout the city. This wasn't immediate, though, and it took another small event for that transition to take place. And now we must pivot to the band Television. The birth of CBGB's as we know it. Friday, August 3, 1973. That was the end of the Mercer Arts Center, and all of the weird music freaks had lost their home base. This is where three guys, Richard Hell, Richard Lloyd, and Tom Verlaine, enter the story. They were looking for a new place that would let their band play. In December of that year, 1973, they were on their way to a bus stop when they noticed a bar named CBGB Omfug. Remember that name? Well, there it is. They walk in and they find owner Hilly Crystal and asked if uh, he might allow them to play. Since the bar wasn't open on Sundays, they asked if they could take the stage on an upcoming Sunday night and just see how things went. Just over three weeks later, 
television played the first ever rock night at CBGB's. Word began to spread, and it didn't take long for the blues and bluegrass to be pushed aside for a new thing called punk rock. And that omfug got dropped. Here's a quote from Medium. The legacy of the CBGB era was not just musical. It affected clothing and makeup and graphics and hairstyles, just to throw out a random list. That said, there was only one way to transport yourself backward. Close your eyes and listen to the music and maybe the sights and sounds and the energy of that tiny place in a crumbling city will come back. Despite the conditions of that time and place, there was a hope and a future in what they did and we are living it. The Mercer Arts Center collapsed. A small band looking for a new home entered a small pub and music was changed forever. New episodes of Poetic Wax debut every single Sunday on YouTube where you can get the visual experience or you can hop onto your favorite podcast platform and give it a listen. I'd love it if you could like, subscribe, rate, review, and honestly, help spread the word. Anything helps. In the decade prior to CBGB's, there was another venue. Place, maybe? Or hub? Something? Well, that something was happening in Chelsea. Next week, I'm going to dig into the story of how Andy Warhol met the Velvet Underground. I'm Andy. This has been an episode of Poetic Wax. This here is the Fence Post Vinyl channel on YouTube. And uh, I'll see you in the next video.